Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guests in the studio today are artist Larry Bell and custom shoemaker Suzanne George. Artist Larry Bell has had solo exhibitions and has been in group shows all over the world. Well over 50 museums, among them the Pompidou in France, the Modern in the Guggenheim in New York, the Ludwig in Germany, and the Tate in London, own his work. He's had grants from the National Endowment, from the Guggenheim Foundation, uh, and he's also gotten the Governor's Award in New Mexico for his fine art, his uh, excellence in the arts. But there's something about Larry that people really don't know. Um, he went to school in Chicago and then he moved to yeah. LA. Oh, he was born in Chicago. They didn't know that. He was born in Chicago and he went to LA. But after each of his openings, he makes this huge pot of chili that is absolutely divine. And I want Larry to just give us a rundown of what's in the chili because after your recipe, there's something else that comes along with it. You mean indigestion? No! <laughs> well, it's simply onions and green chili, pork, garlic, and uh, a few spices. And that's it? Yeah. And how do you put them together and mix them? And First you saute the onions. So you let them cook in a big pot. And this, in the case of the last party we had, we had 16 huge onions. But, but do you do the balance just from your head? Yeah. And, uh, and then I, I brought with me the, the chilies that grow in, in New Mexico because they're see. very good. They're canned, and, and uh, 16 cans of them went into that, into that pot of stuff. And so after the onions have sort of collapsed and softened from cooking, the chilies go in and uh, uh, slices of garlic, elephant garlic, real thin, and, uh, and then that cooks for a while. And when the chilies start to fall apart, you turn the flame down and put the cubed pieces of pork as layers mm. and squirt a little lemon over the uh, pork and a little bit of salt. And you had a wonderful herb in there. Well, there's, there's the spices are turmeric, uh, cumin, and cloves. That's what I tasted. It was so strong. Yeah. But when I first met you, you had this big machine in the studio, big machine, I don't know what to call it, but you were also making recipes. You were coating glass at that time, That's and true. I thought there was so much of a similarity in your mind of putting things together. And um, I remember years ago, <clears throat> this, the glass boxes is one of the things you were famous for. And they all had coatings on them, but people didn't understand what it was. What what actually went into these? Well, the panels of glass that make up the cube uh, were treated with extremely thin films of metals and non-metallic materials like quartz. And the combination of the of the thin layer of metal and the thin film of quartz caused the light that reflected off the surfaces to be interfered with. And it's not too dissimilar to the phenomena of going to a filling station and seeing a little gas on a puddle of water. Those varying rainbow colors are, right. uh, the, uh, uh, are, are because the thickness of the gasoline differs across the surface uh -huh. of the water. And the thickness of the gasoline interferes with the light at a wavelength equivalent to its thickness. And so by depositing a, a layer of quartz over a very thin film of metal, uh, the light is interfered with. So you were transferring those, that process 
to glass and paper. And chili. And chili, no. <laughs> but this is a, also a coated. No, in fact, that, that oh, this piece, isn't. the glass is that color. The glass is made that pink color. So then what, what were you exactly expressing in this where you're using the glass that's a colored glass? Well, I like the density. I, first of all, I, I like the color of the material and the, uh, the densities. You see that uh, the, uh, depending on where the sculpture uh, the viewer uh, was standing. The I overlap see. of the of the panels caused a different density in the color of the material. And the color changes then. No, the, in this piece, the color just becomes richer. It's well, actually the same value. It changes to our eye, no. is what mm -hmm. I was thinking. So you so so that's the kind of thing. Right. And then when you were doing the glazing and and transferring them to paper, yeah. is this a piece on paper? Or? Yes, it is. Yes, um, the elliptical shape is, was a pattern that I worked with uh, for many years. And in the case of this particular image, the, uh, the layers of metals and, and metallic materials were deposited directly on the paper, whereas the glass transmitted and reflected light. The paper did not transmit any light. It absorbed light and reflected it. And so the compositions were really a tapestry of of uh, reflected and absorbed light. But on the paper, on the paper, you get that. It looks like it could be on a piece of glass. I mean, yes, you get the reflection be. the same same way. Uh, Is that were you experimenting with different uh, ideas of of? Um, well, what I was experimenting with with uh, the various surfaces, the different kinds of papers that were available were um, uh, were many and and so I played around with how the light interfaced with the different kinds of papers in this, this, in color this piece. image in this particular image we're looking at a printed image of the of a very large what I call vapor drawing and um, but in the original piece there is no pigment it's it, it's just light that's being interfered with at various wavelengths. Were you a um, mathematics major? <laughs> no. <laughs> what, how did you start getting into this? It's really a lot of formula and it's a lot of mathematics and uh, well, science. People think that. In fact, uh, <laughs> I, I, I just use this process. It's a common industrial process. Uh, it was. It's, it, <clears throat> I don't know how common it is anymore, but uh, it was a way of depositing thin films on any surface and changing the way the light interfaces with the surface but not change the quality of the surface. So the light came off of whatever you put it on differently. If you put it on a piece of glass, oh, it right. still looked like glass, but the way the light came off was different. The lenses of these cameras are coated with a thin film of material that gives us sort of a blush to the uh, front surface of the lens. That's a treatment that allows more light to come through the lens to hit the electronics to get a good picture. It's the same process. And but you had to be thinking about that to get to that point. It was, as I said, Joan, it was a common industrial process and I was looking for a way of uh, working with glass to change the reflective quality of it selectively and uh, in, uh, I, I found an organization out in Burbank that did the process commercially for camera makers in Hollywood and so on. But is, why did it take that box form? Was there something to do with that? That's a great question. I think that the strongest influence in my uh, early years with the, the, the forms I made was the uh, the sort of the tyranny of the architecture of my studios. If you look around this room we're in, and I defy you to count the number of right angles that impinge on your peripheral vision. There are so many of them, so many corners, so many right angle relationships that are part of our our trip, our we life. We just you know, see it, right? We edit them out. And, and I think that probably I decided to isolate the, the corner, the right angle, uh, in my sculptures as a, as a simple element that was taken out of the context uh -huh. of the architecture and made as an example of something to look at. That's, that's interesting because I can see that now. 
I can see when you talk about that, that that's, that's where it went. And you talk about architecture and filling that space or taking out of the space, but you also made furniture that you filled spaces with. Well, my furniture was actually based on this elliptical shape. The, uh, the, the, um, uh, the furniture oh, right. was yeah. based on a quarter of this ellipse, right. and I'm not sure which book has some in it. Oh, I here think we go. I, you have one there? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, these, yeah, there uh, it is. I see. Oh, I see. I'll hold it. Yeah. So you still continue that shape that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. The, the shape... The shape of a 40-degree ellipse it. is I a very, very powerful shape, and there are great cosmic forces that pull on Earth at, a, at an angle of 40 degrees, such as the Andromeda galaxy. I mean, to think that these kinds of things uh, don't impact on us is just not realistic. And, and, I, and so my, the things that influence me in the shapes and, and design of forms come from those kinds of influences. Now, another really heavy influence, I think, that really threw us was the show that you did at Kiyo Higashi's, which was an outgrowth of the 9-11 oh. uh, disaster. And you changed your palette, you changed mm. your color, you changed actually from this shape to different shapes, combining everything. But we have some of those pieces here. Yeah, well, these are collages, the, um, as are the piece, the rest of the work in, in uh, Keo's show. They are layers of various materials. I've always been involved with layering of things, constructing layers of things. And in the case of the works on paper, they are uh, uh, bits and pieces of earlier compositions mm -hmm. that I cut up and, uh, and laid one on top of the other and fused it down and, and all kinds of interesting things happen. And you can from still the, see uh, the, the shiny color on there. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the texture that happens in these images uh, simply comes from uh, the serendipitous use of heat and the potential of the original chips that make up the composition. Because they're, they're laminated down to the surface. And um, in fact, this one is there. that. And so uh, <clears throat> all of this activity out here actually came from the materials that were on one of the canvas chips when it was heated up to the point it liquefied and flowed out and little bits of, of pigments and so on flowed off. In these pieces that make up these collages, uh, there was a lot of uh, acrylic paints and things on the layers of stuff. On and so thing. that's why we see these shards of paint floating out in space. But you yeah. didn't color any of these. No. These are all yeah, they're collaged all collaged. from colors and pieces and, right. and film right. that you have. We have a framed one here. That, which I hope you can see because of the glass uh, not being too reflective. But um, in this piece, there were, there's layers of papers and mylar and laminate film, acrylic paint, metal films. There are probably 50 or 60 layers of material that make up this composition. And, um, and is it heated or is yes, when you heated. laminate it, it's, it's heated? heated. Yeah. I see, I see. But what happened? You went into your studio, and I kind of look around at the psych in this studio. You went into a totally different, you went into orange. Well, I was, <coughs> I was very dismayed, uh, you know, come September 9th. In fact, Janet and I were on our way to Washington, D.C. that morning. There was a, uh, <coughs> it was one of the several times that I've been invited to the White House for a reception. I never went and this is the first time I decided, well, let's go. We may not get oh. <laughs> invited again. And uh, we, we saw the, the, before we left the house to catch our plane out of Albuquerque, it's almost a three-hour drive. Because you live in New Mexico. Right, yeah. right. We, we, uh, we, we saw the first plane hit the towers and then, oh, what a tragedy, uh, and, and got in the car and headed off. We were maybe 20 miles south of where we live when 
I turned on the radio and we heard that all air, that there had been another incident and that all <coughs> air flights were grounded. So I came around, we turned around, I came home and sat on the couch for four days watching the reruns of these buildings being uh, impacted by the airplanes. And I think that <coughs> the larger works in the show, the colors of those pieces comes from the those reruns of the of the planes hitting the uh -oh. orange of the flame and the black of the smoke and so on. I, I have no explanation. For four days, I watched those pictures until I was so depressed I couldn't stand the way I felt. And I went into the studio to see if I could change, do something to change the way I felt. I didn't think I was going to be able to get to work, but I went right to work. But what I did I, was the, the most bizarre set of images. Totally different yeah. from anything you've done. Right, and right. so beautiful. Well, the surfaces are very beautiful. Very yeah. beautiful. The I'm colors. not so convinced that the images are that beautiful. Well, you say but, you see faces in them yeah, and teeth. Yeah, and yeah. Different things. But that the teeth that I see, people have described those things as piano keys, as oh, chiclets, right, right. as pieces of toast. I, you know, right. I mean, uh, so, yeah, but to me, this seems so obvious looking like teeth. In fact, they are not teeth, but they're a little, uh, and they're an enlargement of a digital, uh, a digitized <coughs> enlargement of a grid pattern, oh, right. a detail of a grid pattern that I printed up and, and combined in. When I cut the earlier work down, there was some work that had a lot of grids in it. Oh, and it made... And, and, uh, and I simply took one of those scraps and laid it on the scanner for my computer and scanned that detail and then played around with distorting it, printed them larger, cut them out of the paper that they were printed on, and <coughs> layered them into the rest of the stuff that I normally work with. Uh -huh. Yeah, Which was piled up on top mm -hmm. of you. Well, everyone has to see those works, and they can well, judge. For, <laughs> and they can judge for themselves. Yes, Larry, thank yes. you so much. Oh, it's always a pleasure I've to been, see you. I've so. been wanting to have you on the show, and I'm I know, so glad. I know, and this is, it was wonderful that it worked out this time. <laughs> thank right. you, thank, thank you. you. Don't go away. We'll be right back with Suzanne George. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with custom shoemaker Suzanne George. Suzanne was born in Los Angeles, went to Reseda High School, and UC Santa Barbara. Then she went on in 1993 to Cordwainer's Technical <laughs> College in London to learn the shoe trade. Um, there was some time in between UC SB uh -huh. and going to London. What was going on uh -huh. then? <laughs> a lot of different things actually. <clears throat> I had a whole stint in kind of the investment banking arena straight out of as an undergrad and then um, So you had another life? Another life and then sort of went from that to sort of the did some graduate studies in counseling psychology and <laughs> then had sort of a whole kind of nonprofit end of things and then had been thinking about the shoes for at least 10 years, 15. Why? Why shoes? Yeah, and I don't know, because it, especially doing it in the fashion that I do, it's just a mystery. It's really a mystery. And it, it, the more I do it and the longer I do it, the way I'm doing it, it's a bigger mystery. So, oh, good. So yeah. we're, not, we're not the only ones no. who are clueless here. <laughs> and somebody to find cord waners. Yes. Wang, how do you say it? Cord waners. Technical cord waners. College. It's been absorbed now. It's part of the London Fashion College. Oh, it is. So, but it was, was a separate shoe. Separate, yes, in the east end of London, and that was a fabulous experience. Really and then fabulous. from there, when how long did you go there? I was there for an overseas kind of condensed course, and then I spent the rest of my stay in London apprenticing with different shoemakers there. You went to John Lobb. Mm -hmm. How did you get an apprenticeship with John Lobb, who is probably the epitome of shoemakers, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. when you say John Lobb, you think, oh, handmade shoes. Yeah, and I was really, I think in my naivete, it was probably the best way because <laughs> I didn't really know Really How did, important. Yeah, and, and actually it was more of an observership which worked out really well because I could really see their entire process over like a nine month period. And then the other shoemakers that I apprenticed oh. with worked similarly in the way that I do doing everything by hand, by One traditional One was methods. John Moak. Yes. And um, then the other... What did he do? He does um, high fashion, men's and women's, oh, all I handmade. See. 
Um, Where Lob was more sturdy. Yes, sort of the classic, conservative, yes, classic. full bodied English, all <laughs> right. handmade, all made to measure. Johnny Mokes were um, handmade, but they were, they were off the shelf. Oh, they, yes. and were they Ready more to, whimsical? Or did they have more of a style? Some, some <clears throat> yeah. Some, but I, whimsical, I would say, was the other woman that I apprenticed Hannah. with. Hannah. Yeah, Hannah Goldman, and she did all very ornamented, beaded wedding attire. Mo only for women. Is that right? Yeah. So I got a chance to really learn about working with fabric and working with delicate things like that. And, and she also did sort of a, a made-to-order version. They weren't made to measure, but it was, again, all hands-on in her studio. Everything happened on site. And so when you make a shoe, when they were making shoes, did they use traditional forms or did they make their own forms? forms. In the case of John Lobb, <coughs> they make their own forms out of a rough turn of beech wood, where in the other case of the others, they use a stock last that they'll refashion. So beech wood is the kind of material mm -hmm. that's used? Yeah, it's just a rough Why? turn of wood. It's strong and it absorbs things and you can sort of use it over a period of time. It also stands up under weather conditions and things. Can, do you change that? Uh, Last, the form? can you yes. change the form? Absolutely. For like, if you want to make my shoes, you could change it and then use it for yours? Yes, absolutely. In fact, this last year, as an example, this is Let a... Let me hold it. You can. Yeah, that's an, an old vintage last that I refashioned the toe. I sort of sliced oh, out. Oh, you did. Yeah, oh, and you then... You see the difference And there? then those are my silly tracing marks for the design that we use. Whereas most of the time what I do is I take a rough turn of wood... So this is the old part, and yes. this is how you've changed it. And that's what it. I've changed. Whereas in this one, this was actually just a rough turn of wood that I started fashioning up. So this is your own that you've... Mm -hmm. What I did here, you can see I sort of took some liberties and had to get back into reality and, and sort of build in inside and outside joints and things that are, you know, because we do everything made to measure. Now look, there's a hole here. What yes. is this? That's actually when we're mounting the shoe. It's the peg that the shoe will sit on. Do you have to put that in there? Sometimes. Sometimes the, the rough turns would come with those. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so you, do you get just something like this? To from start? A, yeah. And then I do a whole series of... <laughs> so where does this come from? You can buy them. You can buy them. I buy... Most of the time I try to buy old vintage lots of things. Oh, you do. It's, yeah. So it's like hats. You can use a hat for them and make yes. a... Yes. Yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. So yeah. you buy this and then you design your shoe, shoe from on this? That. And most of the time what I do is because we do a series of tracings and measurements, kind of diagnostic information, then I get the shape that I want to work with after speaking with whoever the client is and get an idea of what they want. Then we start sort of sculpting it out of that, building uh -huh. in a toe shape, build, you know, a, heel, a pitch for the heel is built into this and everything. Then you start designing on that because sometimes you show somebody a style of something. Oh, like what would this co correspond to that we have here? I did um, a mule for this one. When I did a mule, this is where my my design lines okay. are. Okay, let's see that. Yeah. So it would be this. This, and in fact, that actual design is this picture here. She's kind of broad in the joints, and you sort of have to build the shape first. It's kind of like. I think working on a house, maybe you have to kind of see what the land is. It is it for a particular person? Custom, yeah, all oh, these. these are yeah. all custom. Yeah. I see. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, where do we start? You, ha you come in and uh -huh. you say, I want, a, I want a pair of shoes. Why would I come in to you and say, I want a pair, pair of shoes? shoes? A lot of different reasons. Some people come because they're getting married. Some come because they have fit concerns and they can't find commercially produced shoes that fit them well. Some are really sort of into the whole handmade sort of traditional method aspect and some kind of both they have the need and the desire so I come to you and mm -hmm. I say I um, want a chic pair of shoes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't find anything that looks great so mm -hmm. what do you do with me then I start looking at your foot and doing all my <laughs> diagnostic things and trying to get a read of who you are too so I can design uh, around that <coughs> and also look at you know the natural shape of your foot and what's been happening and then when I'm sculpting out the last, I can then know not only building in your fitting, but building in an appropriate toe shape that would work and a heel height that's appropriate for your fitting. So should we, let's, let's look at this, because sure. this is a beauty. Mm -hmm. Now that actually, <coughs> because I have some orthopedic shoemaking training, I try to build in, in most of the shoes, even though hopefully it's not, it's sort of under disguise, but there's usually some kind of, oftentimes some kind of adjustment. There's always something that's supportive, like I'll try even like with a wedge, we'll try to bring in a wedge heel that's also supportive in the heel as well. You mentioned uh, the fabrics, the leathers are beautiful, mm -hmm. and this design on this is great. You do Thanks. all of that. Yeah, yeah, we do everything, yeah. 
Uh, you mentioned that you worked for an orthopedic mm -hmm. shoemaker. Yeah, part of my time in London I spent with some orthopedic shoemakers and when I came back to San Francisco I spent a lot of time and I still work alongside a gentleman who does only orthopedic Are shoes. Are they craftsmen the same way that, yes. you, that, that yeah. these other shoes? Yeah, so we carve all those heels by hand out of wood. Same and, type of thing? Yeah. Yeah, so everything's got some little bells. I mean, even Let, let's look at that. Is it fabric? This is. This is a. I'm really fond of sailor pants and other kinds of, uh, you know, sort of military wear. And this is the same um, wool silk that they can they use on the old and it works pants. and it doesn't wear out. And yeah, and it's a bit of a challenge to work with, but I really like it and I like working with fabric a lot. One other thing, because our time runs out so fast, this shoe which I think is incredible. It's made from? Stingray, yeah, which is a, a challenge of its own. That's why in this area of the shoe, we put some French calf in order to make it easier for us to work with. Is it tough? Is it, it is wearable? So tough. It, it feels like it could survive a nuclear. Is that right? It's something so or other, some to, explosion or something. It's so hard to realize. And yeah. it looks so pebbly and beautiful and shiny. And I love the fabric. Let's see, what else? We have this, a two-tone shoe. Oh, yes, uh-huh. And I started this is some that's a pebble grain, scotch grain up here with some alligator and so we've been, you know, working more with exotics, which I'm really enjoying. And this actually was custom designed around some handbags. Would you use um uh, antique ornamentations on any of these I things? I do, often, especially on the bridal shoes, I do. Oh, I bet yeah. that's great. Yeah, and actually we do make a lot of, because we do men's shoes as well. Oh, We've where's our men's shoe? Let's Next see. to you. Here's one men's shoe, yeah. <laughs> but, but you use the antique ornamentation? You know, often on bridal shoes and other shoes as well, um, depending on who the client is, what the occasion is, what kind of function the shoe is for. Yeah. And is it fun? It is fun. It's a total <laughs> labor of love. Messy and challenging and fun. And leaving yeah. your stock market and all your business yes. career, is this a good place to you be? Know, it is. And, and, you know, thinking of back and looking at it, it is. It's a great decision. It's been long in coming. But you don't show in boutiques, I, I don't expect. No. Because most, you must have your own place. Yeah, we sell direct and we work out of a workshop setting so people can get oh. a sense of what, yeah, what goes into them. And that's really. in San Francisco. It is. Oh, yes. well, I'm so glad you came down Thank to be you, with Joan. us. Thank you, It's a pleasure. Thank you. So much fun. Thank you. For that, me as well. Yeah. <laughs> All this handmade stuff. Yeah. It's so great. Thanks. thanks for being here and thanks to Suzanne George and keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, uh, 44th floor. And thanks to Larry Bell for bringing this painting and Kiyo Higashi's gallery. Uh, see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.